Welcome back to The Great Camera Shootout 2011, Episode 2. In case you haven't seen Episode 1, we need to clarify a few things. This is a documentary about the single-chip camera evaluation. The SCCE was designed and administered by Robert Prime's ASC. Zacuto didn't have any involvement with the testing whatsoever. This year, we are testing only large sensor cinema-style cameras. Camera manufacturers were invited to be involved and send a camera master for their camera. If they declined to send anyone, Bob picked a camera master for them. Station chiefs oversaw every test to keep it consistent. External data recorders were used to get the best possible image when possible. Minimal color correction was used to make raw data into visible images. As with all Zacuto camera shootouts, you'll hear viewer comments from 2K screenings from around the world to give you that cinema experience here on the web. The cameras in this year's tests are the Sony F35, the Arri Alexa, the Red One with the MX sensor. The Epic was not available to us at the time of this test. The Sony F3, the Panasonic AF100, 35mm film, Kodak stocks 5219 and 5213, the Phantom Flex, the Weiss Cam HS2, the Canon 1D Mark IV, 5D Mark II, 7D, and the Nikon D7000. Episode 1 was about dynamic range. We'll build on that in this episode and we'll be discussing sensitivity, sharpness, and compression. Let's start with sensitivity. Sensitivity in measured in film cameras is the amount of light to take a gray object and put it at gray right in the middle of the scale. Sensitivity in video cameras is much harder to, to define and the reason is video cameras have got all sorts of different contrast scales. And so sensitivity in a video camera should be measured in the amount of noise, signal to noise, there are in the blacks. And if there's a signal in the, in the blacks, there's actually a signal there, and when that signal gets to be the same level as noise, you generally call that the uh, threshold. Some images are, are, are noisy, and you see it as a sort of a dot pattern in the shadow areas. Um, you generally see noise in um, monochromatic areas like skin or uh, a wall that's just one color or, or in a dark corner of the shot. So noise really is something that, it's a matter of taste. Some people don't like any noise, some people don't care that much about noise. It depends on the, the aesthetic parameters of a particular shot, but um, in general, um, the better cameras with better processing power are going to give you less noise and low light. To measure the signal to noise ratio of each camera, Michael Bravin shot an opto-electronic conversion function or OECF chart. This chart uses 20 different gray patches that are analyzed by software to determine how the sensor converts the illumination into digital values. From this data, the sensitivity of each camera can be calculated. Here are the signal-to-noise ratios that Jack Holm calculated from the charts. These numbers are based on how much noise or grain is present in the image. Cameras that have higher numbers have less noise, but some of the cameras record with a high compression rate that smooths out the noise, but this can degrade the final image. Stephen Lighthill ASC lit an extremely dark scene that would test the limits of how much low-light detail the cameras could record. This is a low-light challenge. 
We have lit this scene very, very darkly. To prove that it's dark, we have three candles that when Grace puts her face down to blow them out, you can see her face is actually overexposed by three candles. We have um, many, many layers of gradations, and it's basically seeing into this dark a set, how well does each camera do? You know, basically, there's a barger light back there with a bag on it, and through a six by doing tie there. Right now, he's about a stop under. When he sits in the car, is three stops under. The Bird Motel is gonna be a check of when a camera's working in low light, how what the dynamic range is like, because that's like six stops. It'll be a good test. The cameras that are happier, less than 800, EI are, are going to struggle a little bit, although they should do fine with the with that key line and, and grace, but they'll have trouble with uh, Ty and the Porsche in the background. And so this is a test in sensitivity. You can't just trust what the ISO is on a camera. You've got to go and see how does it do? What does it look like? Can you see blacks from dark grays? Can you see something without crawling noise? How bad is the noise? So this test is designed to see the quality differences between the 12 cameras at an extreme challenge of very low light. The lens was locked off at an f-stop of 2.0. The camera master could manipulate the ISO and other settings on the camera in order to record the best low light image detail. Now let's see the footage from the cameras. First we'll show you a comparison of just the woman's face with the candlelight. Bob chose the Arri Alexa to be a reference for this scene. This does not mean it performed best. It's simply a reference. Don't confuse compression with noise. For example, Look at the 1D Mark IV. On the wall to the right, the blockiness you see is compression, not noise. Yeah, I was, I was looking at on the right-hand side of the, where the, uh, the couch, there was the gradient on the curved wall there, so you're able to just kind of see where how that was working out. I think it was really the Weiss cam in general, even more so than the Phantom. In the shadow area, it just seemed like very noisy to me. Well, I guess it's only now that the tools are good enough that they actually are yeah. skipping ahead. I mean, the, the Alexa in that, that dark scene with the woman with the, with the candle, <laughs> a standout, you know, you got so much shadow detail. In it. Just to see how, how far the digital sensors reached into the shadows, that was, that, that just kind of killed film right there. Film still looks beautiful. But wow, is it ever jarring to see the grain. Regarding the grain with the film, I also was surprised that it's so grainy, but on the other hand, it's a bit of an uneven comparison because all the digital cameras have noise reduction built in. So, and you just assume that, you know, it's just the standard thing you do when you develop film. And I noticed um, the Alexa was actually a little bit noisy on the couch. Um, and the F3 held up pretty well, I thought. I think once you hit the F3 and then below, uh, the Panasonic was, it looked okay, but everything below the F3 kind of, it just the image quality didn't really compare in my opinion to the other cameras. Now let's see a comparison of the man and the car in the background. The Alexa will be the reference again. I was looking at the guy as he came into the car and looking at where his hairline 
met his face. And where on some of the cameras, you basically got, you got a shadow instead of the hairline. And that actually did give the true indication of the differences between the cameras, I thought. And I thought the Alexa handled it the best. It seemed very sharp in the, uh, not only a lack of noise, but I could see further into the shadows. I could see more detail inside the, inside the Porsche and the, uh, the grain pattern looked much more pleasing to me. Uh, some of the bamboo stalks in the back and, um, and then the smoke. Uh, it was different for different scenes, obviously. If it was even rendered in the shadows, it, it, was, it would really get swallowed up or, or appear, depending on the camera. I thought the F-35 would look better. It looked very grainy and low light tests, um, more than I expected. So I was looking more on the, I guess, the background where it's just the one solid color and you're just seeing the constant movements with those flat pictures. I noticed in the DSLR cameras, I was actually disappointed in the signal to noise ratio and uh, the blacks when we were testing that because it got very blocky. Um, it wasn't just, you know, grainy noise type thing. It was kind of that blocky noise. To be clear, the 35 millimeter film in this comparison has not been degrained. Some cameras use noise reduction as part of their image processing pipeline to create a cleaner image, but this process often creates a softer image that can affect the sharpness. The perceived sharpness of an image is influenced by many factors. There is the actual resolution of the camera, the acuteness or edge contrast of an image, the depth of field of a scene, the resolving power of the lens, the use of an optical low-pass filter, and the compression of the final image. These factors can work together and sometimes against each other and may affect how sharp an image looks when viewed. In the testing, we made extensive use of the Fujinon Premier zoom lenses. These are considered some of the best lenses available with a resolving power of over 4,000 lines. Each camera was also recorded to an external recorder through HDSDI in order to minimize the effects of compression. But some of the cameras compress the image before allowing the signal to be recorded, and some cameras like the DSLRs are unable to record externally at all. But we'll talk about that a little later on. Resolution is technically how many lines you can resolve. So if you can resolve 200 lines, that's sharper than 100 lines. The problem is, Without contrast, a high resolution looks flat and to the eye doesn't look all that sharp. So perceived sharpness is a combination of contrast and resolution. To measure the resolution of each camera, a three foot wide Siemens star chart was shot by Matt Siegel. Uh, this is your standard Siemens star, but it is on steroids and this is for uh, MTF function. Uh, we're running at 640 ASA and gives us a standardized stop of four and two thirds and we set all the cameras to, be, uh, to match that light. In fact, what we're doing is keeping the same lens and same stop and just swapping out the bodies, trying to reduce the variables. Right. So trying to keep it as objective as possible. We'll zoom in on the center star so that you can see the comparative differences in resolution. Here are the numbers Jack Holm calculated from the original files. The blue bars represent the physical resolution of the sensor. The red bars show the detail that was calculated from the charts. The red bars were calculated as the spatial frequency response of the entire imaging system using the slanted edge method. For the F3, the measured resolution was equal to its physical resolution. It seems like, you know, like the, the Panasonic was just really sharp throughout the depth of field. The other ones just got really soft. I've also never seen any footage from that Panasonic, that tiny Panasonic AF100, that has been worth a damn until now. That is, I, all of the footage I've seen has been terrible. That's actually a viable tool. I would actually go for that over the 7D or the 5D. I thought the F3 was, was Im impressive, uh, but with the sharpness, especially I was actually kind of surprised. I know Sony tends to kind of have a sharpening 
look to the video. Uh, a lot of their cameras, maybe just because it's more of a broadcast kind of, you always think of Sony as broadcast, but that was actually uh, kind of surprising and impressive. Yeah, the 70 actually looked a little sharper than the 5D when you look, that, that's, that was my eye. You know, it is interesting to see like it against the Alexa or the, or the MX, and when you see them side by side, when you're looking for it, yeah, the digital SLRs are you know, noticeably softer. Compression has a lot to do with why the Canon cameras look softer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're H.264 compression, whereas all the other cameras are coming off two wire. So you're just you're just getting a lot more information there. There is so many things. I mean, everyone talks about resolution as being a big thing. Talk to makeup people about resolution, and they hate it. You know, it's all relative. I mean, this. You know, if you use things for. Um, what they can really be used for. You can take advantage of them. Even H.264 can actually be an advantage sometimes, you know, because that lack of resolution um, can sometimes help you. I'm sure that you noticed that some of the charts looked out of focus or soft. Some viewers commented that this might be a problem with the back focus. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of video and a still from one of the DSLRs. Because of compression and resolution downsampling, the video can look soft in comparison. Compression removes information from the image in order to speed up image processing or to make the file size smaller. One of the main parts of an image that's compressed is color. Most of the sensors in our test use what's called a bear pattern to record individual values of red, green, and blue. This data is interpolated to create pixel values with full color data. This compression is called 444. This is generally the least compressed visible image available from a camera. To save space, some cameras remove color data from the image. This is called 422, and removing even more color data is referred to as 420. On top of this, many cameras do other sorts of image compression with onboard codecs. This can seriously degrade the best image the camera is capable of producing. Bob wanted to test the best possible images that the cameras could record. So the majority of the test footage in this documentary was recorded with either the S2 or the Codex. These are professional off-board recorders that are used to record the best quality HD-SDI signal that the cameras could provide. With the Phantom, Weiss Cam, RED, and DSLRs, the onboard recorder was the best available footage. In most images, it's difficult to see compression. But to help us see the difference, Matt Siegel shot a chart called the Ringer. This chart looks similar to a focus chart, except that the rings have different pairs of colors. These can be difficult for a camera to record without aliasing. We'll show you both the onboard and offboard recordings for each camera where they're available. So with the combination of compression and resolution, we can start to see some differences between the higher-end cameras and the lower-end cameras. 
but how do these differences appear in real life? In episode one, we showed the scene with the window. One of the details in the scene was the red dress with the white polka dots. Here's a blow up of that dress. Some of the cameras had difficulty resolving the fine detail. On the lower cameras, which you know I'm all excited to shoot with, um, there was a lot of moray action, especially in the, the, the lower left quadrant stuff. And um, I was surprised to see that it lost detail so quickly. From the F3 price range up, um, there was a noticeable difference with things like sharpness and the moray. When you're doing tests on um, on the moray, and yes, it's very easy to see the, the points at which they fall down. Um, but as far as as, as them looking acceptable, looking good, looking very pleasant. Yeah, I think the, 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 the digital, digital SLRs stood up incredibly well. A Still Life was designed by Rhonda Ralston and lit by Stephen Lighthill ASC and Nancy Schreiber ASC. There is fine detail in the spices and the colored flowers that you'll see in this blow up. A grip unplugged a light and didn't turn it back on. So unfortunately, the Alexa is missing a highlight in the scene. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. The Sony F35 was chosen as the reference. I was just saying to Garrett, I was sort of surprised with the DSLR footage in particular and the fruit scene and the spices. There appeared to be like a serious resolution or sharpness drop and I mean I, I expected that to a degree but I guess I was surprised that it was as rapid a decrease in sharpness and resolution as it was. I was expecting better color reproduction in the cannons and it felt like because of the compression and the, the 420 color space it was really 
falling off compared to some of the more the more raw formats where you're really getting that full, you know, you could really see it in that yellow powder that was on the plate. You could just really see it really fluctuating. And again, it was like soft and it was losing color. And I was like, wow, I thought the cannon would be more on than that, you know. And again, I think it's 420 compression. You know, as the budget's changing, uh, budget changes, you know, we've had to adapt to different cameras and kind of deal with the compression and deal with the sharpness. I mean, we kind of took to DSLRs because we pretty much had to. And um, seeing the, the test, especially with the AF100 and, you know, with uh, everybody's complaining about the codec and seeing you guys break that down, that was, uh, and seeing how it compared to the F3 and how those compared to the bigger cameras, that was, I think, the biggest surprise. With that compression on there on the AF100, even then, the color rep reproduction was still very close to, to what the originals, to the master was, and that just blew me away, to know that that was a, very, a new option that we could do that's bringing the quality back up. Certain manufacturers tend to bat about the resolution numbers where with the tests and evaluations that we've seen, um, it shows that the overall camera package you know, the camera performance overall, dynamic range, resolution, compression, is to outweigh just one number alone. But it was sort of um, uh, uh, shocking in a way to see how the stills cameras, which are, uh, I've got a 5D Mark II, which is, takes beautiful stills, but to see it in, in, in the cinema uh, comparison, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't work at all. These are cameras that were not designed as movie cameras. Even sure. Canon will tell you that. I mean, Canon will tell you that they stumbled into it. So when you're skipping lines and you're taking a sensor that's ten, 10 times as big and you're deriving 24 frame uh, 1080, 1920 video out of it and you're compressing it within the camera rather than putting a bigger data stream out, you can't expect those cameras to compete with 50, $100,000 cameras specially made for it. Sometimes when they show the charts of, you look at the measurement of the numbers, and then you go into the test thinking that you're going to be able to see that. And in some cases, a camera that scored better looked worse to my eye. So it's interesting to look at the, the numbers and then see that actually, you know, we're, we're dealing with sort of an alchemy that you can't measure. And then it's so important to see the, the images themselves. This isn't a test that indicates you should or advocates for one camera over another. It's a test that says, there might be a camera out there that's best suited for this environment or this particular story that you're trying to tell. And I think that's what we all have to understand is that you might have one camera that works really well for one situation and another camera might not. Uh, and I think that's our biggest challenge in the industry is determining what format we want to use, when we want to use it, for what story we're trying to tell. We have one more episode coming out in August that will cover motion artifacts, color, and skin tone. We have an exciting twist in episode three, so make sure you stay tuned for it. And if you missed it, episode one covers latitude and dynamic range and can be seen right now at secuto.com in our web series pull-down menu. We also want to thank all the companies that donated resources to help put this whole test together, especially Eric Kessler from Kessler Crane, who was a financial contributor along with Secuto for this documentary. Many rental houses in LA graciously donated the equipment to make this test happen. And we'd like to especially point out the contributions of Claremont Camera, who donated over $2 million worth of equipment. We have to thank the 150 technicians and volunteers that donated their time and experience to put together such a successful test. Additionally, we want to thank all our friends from around the world who helped organize and attended our screenings. In all, 772 people were involved in this production. Our editors are hard at work to bring you episode three. So we'll see you next month for the final episode of The Great Camera Shootout 2011.